Hey there everyone, Scott Sambucci here. The The last couple of weeks, and even more than the last couple of weeks, uh, going into say the last month and a half, has been a really exciting and uh, an awfully curious time for me. And I want to explain why that is. I've been doing a lot of sort of live events. I've done a couple of live workshops with entrepreneurs, people that run startups, people that run early stage companies. And I've also done some speaking. So I, I was live at a conference down in San Diego where I spoke to a pretty large room of business owners. And I also went to a, a conference, an event, where there were lots of startups, lots of business owners, people that were learning about sales strategies and how they're going to grow from where they are to obviously where they want to be. And, and the reason I, it's obviously exciting, right? You're getting out, you're talking to like hundreds and hundreds of people about their businesses and their, their vision and their mission and their ideas and their dreams. And it was also really curious for me as well, because the more that I talked with a lot of these different startup CEOs or founders or business owners, the more that I felt like my, my job, the work that I do here with my company is so critically important. And I want to explain a couple of things around that. And then behind me, I've got a whiteboard because as I do my speaking, as I do my teaching in various workshops, there's a couple of, of really kind of simple models that I feel like are pretty important for people out there that are that are learning how to how to grow and how to scale their companies and how to grow and scale their startups. And so if I could sort of boil everything down into just a couple of things, there's there's probably two two lessons or two things that I've seen when it comes to running a startup that make it really, really hard or running a company in general that make it really, really hard. Now of course, there are a lot more than two, but the, these are the two things that, that really kind of stuck out for me, given my perspective and given the work, given all the work that I do helping companies grow. And the, the, first, the first sort of learning or the first lesson here is that as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a founder, as a, somebody that runs a company, and this is whether your company is five days old or five years old or 15 years old, as an entrepreneur, and I'm in this boat too, because I, I have my own company, we are willing to work really, really hard. Like we will put in time, we will put in effort, we will grind, and we will grind and we will grind and we will grind. And that's actually part of the problem because what ends up happening is we grind ourselves to a halt. We get to the point where we just can't do anymore. It gets to the point that instead of reaching our potential, we reach our limits, the limits of what we're just capable of doing. We, we're out of energy, we're out of time, there's no more weekends, there's no more nights, there's no more, there's no more stuff we can do, there's no more effort we can put forth. And when you get to that point where you, you don't feel like you are reaching your potential and instead you're reaching the end of your rope, you're reaching your limit, that's when the whole, the whole thought of running your company, it starts to wear on you. Right, because you feel like, man, I, I've got this mission, I've got this vision, I had this idea of how I wanted my company to look, and instead of installing the systems that are going to allow us to grow, and and build the company that we want, we end up in a situation of what I call a never-ending startup mode, and this hits obviously it hits startups that have been around for months and even years, where they've they've gotten a few early customers, they've gotten some revenue, but they never really figured out how to break out. And so, they're, yeah, they're a startup, and everybody likes the idea of having a startup and being at a startup or working at a startup, but the fact is we actually don't want to be a startup. We want to be a more mature company that has systems, that has repeatability, that has scalability, so that we can solve the problem that we're out to solve. Uh, and the same goes if you're a, an established company. Even if you've been out there for, for a while, and some of the business owners that I talked with at the a conference where I was speaking, a lot of them are in many ways acting like startups, even though they've been around for five or 10 or 15 years or longer in some cases, because they've never figured out how to really grow their company, they're in this never ending startup mode. And over time, it starts to feel like sales purgatory, like you, you know there's something better and you're, you're, may, you might be out of the worst of it, like you've got your company running, you've got things going, you've got revenue, you've got customers, but you've never, you're never getting out of that, that kind of middle stage or that early stage. So that's the first lesson, and I want to talk about a few things uh, in, just a, in just a couple minutes 
that I think will help you maybe position where you are and how you can get to that next level. So that's the first thing is just that we're willing to work really hard and that in a lot of ways serves to our detriment if we don't put together and implement the right systems that allow us to scale and grow. The, the second lesson um, that I learned from, from being out there uh, in the market is that sometimes it's really hard to ask for help because we, as business owners, like we, we sh we're trying to figure things out. We have, we have teams, we have a staff, we have employees, we have investors in some cases, we have partners, we have advisors, we have spouses that expect us to know what we're doing. And it can feel a little bit embarrassing in some cases to not know what to do next. And worse, not to know how or when to ask for help. And because we wanna feel confident, we wanna know that we have a plan that works. And asking for help is really, really tough. And it's, it's really, and that's the second piece, which I feel like, based on my observations, being out, talking to people, make it really hard to run a business. It's knowing when and how to ask for help. And those two things, out of all the things that I've observed, seem to be the ones that kind of rise to the top. And so given those, those two lessons, those two observations, that, it's, that we're willing to work hard and hard work is not enough, and secondly, that sometimes we don't know when or how to ask for help, that's why I wanted to condense just a couple of the learnings, a couple of the models, a couple of the perspectives that I might have that will help you as you're thinking about your business, as you're thinking of growing out of sales purgatory, as you're thinking about growing out of never-ending startup mode, right? So um, I realize that the lighting is not perfect. I realize that that uh, maybe the audio is not perfect. I just chose this format because it's easy for me to get a bunch of information out. So uh, I really want you to focus on the education piece here more than anything. And I also encourage you as I, as I kind of get going here, uh, those of you who have, have seen me before teach, you know I love to teach. I've been teaching for more than 10 years at different universities and doing workshops with and, and doing speaking for that long or more. Um, to me, it's more important to just get the information out. And so I just wanted to get this to you. And I would encourage you as I'm drawing some of these models and kind of walking through, there's three in particular that I want to go through. Um, you can either draw this out on your own. So if you've got a scrap piece of paper, just you know, draw these out. And then secondly, I want you to think about where you feel like you fall in these frameworks with your company. So the, so the first model I want to talk about is what I, what I consider kind of the path that we're all trying to hit, right? So it's, we begin at startup mode. Once we get out of startup mode, we're in some kind of ramp up mode, and then we want to hit scale up mode. And so in startup mode, typically what we're focused on here is getting customers. So of course, we want to make a lot of money if we can. We want to get as much revenue per customer if possible. However, when we're in startup mode, probably more importantly, we just want to validate the problem product market fit. We, went, we need a couple of those early customers. And a lot of times, it's just getting those first 10. It's kind of a rough number that I've found. Like once we find those first 10 customers that are, that are happy and paying for our product or service, then we've achieved some level of validation around that product market or that problem product market fit. So that first stage, that startup stage, is just all about getting those first customers, right? And then this is where, though, a lot of companies don't even get out of this mode because there's a lot of, there's a lot of just basic systems that need to be put in place in order to get those early customers. There's things like uh, a funnel filter uh, and a funnel filler. How are you getting those early, oh, those early leads into your early sales conversations? There are things that systems like having a qualification questioning tree. So when you're talking to early prospects, how are you qualifying them? How do you know that they are the right fit for your product or service? And together, those form what I call a prospecting plan of action. And when I talk to teams, and, I, and again, whether it's an early stage team or a more established company, many times companies don't have a clear prospecting plan of action. And then from there, once you've got those, once you've got those, those leads, if you will, qualified, then it's demo design and sales meeting preparation. It's uh, pilot programs and closed plans. These are all part of what's called your sales map. So how do you get somebody from early conversation through to paying the customer, getting those first, those first 10 customers? So 
If you're able to accomplish that, then you move into this little bit of a transition phase. It's not a, a quick binary that goes directly from, hey, I'm in startup stage to ramp up stage. There's kind of this, this middle area in between. And to make the transition from focusing on customers to then ramping up, and this is where we start focusing more and more on revenue, right, the dollars, the dollars in the door, maybe I'll use green, I should probably use green for revenue here. Right. So to get from just purely customer acquisition phase to revenue growth phase, there's this transitory period. And that's where systems like having a customer success strategy or pricing protocols, for example, knowing when to charge a little less, when to charge a little bit more, having a pipeline pull through strategy. So that as you're having these deals come through, those early customers, a lot of times you can get through relationships and you can get them without having really clear plans because they're early adopters. They're just happy and excited that you exist, that you can solve their problem because nobody else has been able to solve their problem before. But making that transition from customer phase to revenue phase or from startup phase into ramp up phase means that you have to have these other systems in place. And then once you hit the revenue phase, that's where things get, you get pretty, this is where things get really serious when it comes to the sales part of things. Because to, to generate revenue and to grow, both grow the number of customers and grow the dollars per customer, there's a lot of sales systems that are required. So, uh, to, to sort of give it a fun name, there's, there's what I call the real deal detector. So as you're growing the top of the funnel, how do you know which deals are real and which ones are not? Which customers are serious and which ones are not? Which customers can pay you more and which ones can't? Um, there's, there's having prospect partner strategies, for example. There's having a work plan, having a work plan builder strategy, as an example. How, do you, how are you going to give your customers confidence that if they're going to buy from you, these are all the things that are going to happen to help you make, to help it be successful. Also in this revenue phase, is there's, in, especially in large enterprise, whether it's a service or a software product, then having a really clear land and expand strategy, because sometimes you can't just get the big deal out of the gate, but if you can find something really specific, begin there and then grow. That's going to allow you to grow the revenue, starting with some of those early customers. So that's what gets you from startup phase to ramp up stage is installing some of these systems, right? And then finally, we want, of course, now we've got ramp up stage, that's where we want to get to scale up stage. And this stage, this final stage is all around process. It's building, it's building the machine is the way I think about it. It's so that the company has its own framework, its own, its own lattice, its own engine that just runs, right? And just like there's this transition from customers to revenue, there's a transition phase here to go from ramp up stage to scale up stage, right? And in order to get from ramp up to scale up, scale up by definition means you're scaling up not just the customer base, but you're scaling up the way products are getting produced, the way products are being sold, the way customers are being serviced. Everything about your company needs to scale. And a lot of times this means growing the organization, growing the number of people working on sales and marketing and customer success. And in that transition phase from revenue to process or from ramp up phase to scale up stage, this is where you need to do things like, like assess your revenue acquisition portfolio is, is one example. Doing activity audits, knowing what tasks need to be consolidated into a new role or a new position, or what are the jobs or functions of the people that you're going to hire as part of this scale up, this scale up stage, right? Knowing how to run sales sprints on a daily, weekly, monthly basis so that you can keep your teams focused and get to the end results that you need every, every month or every quarter to hit those numbers that you need to hit because you have investors or you have expectations from different partners, right? And so once you've kind of made it through that transition and doing those assessments that I just talked about, now the process phase, this is the, this is the fun phase, right? This is the scale up phase, right? We all love that sort of hockey stick growth that allows us to show that we've hit product market fit, that we're really starting to scale the company, really starting to hit on the mission and starting to achieve the vision, the long-term vision of the company. And so this process phase has got its own set of challenges, right? There's things like having a sales hiring system, knowing how to initiate interviews, knowing how to recruit, Know how to build compensation plans so that the team is motivated and has the right incentives that match 
with the company growth metrics around revenue and customers, profitability, cost reduction, all of those things, right? It's knowing your sales management stack, knowing how to do the daily, weekly, monthly sprints and management structures, knowing your metrics and KPIs, knowing how to hire and knowing how to fire if you need to, because the, the dead weight is really gonna pull you down when it comes to being able to scale. So all of these pro all of this is about process. It's about managing the team. It's finding the team and managing the team so that you can scale the way you can. Because again, we, we talked about this earlier. You can't just keep working harder as a one person shop or as a small team. You have to get from early customers to revenue and then to get from revenue to, to process and scale up. That's where you're gonna need a much larger team and you need to know how to hire them, how to manage them, and how to give them the right incentives so that they are achieving the outcomes that you need them to achieve. So I want you to think about kind of your own company, whether you are a five day old startup, you've been around for five months or five years, where do you feel like you are? Are you still running around just looking for those early customers and not really achieving the amount of revenue per customer that you deserve to get based on the value that you're achieving? Or maybe you're in this revenue phase, you're trying to get the scale up phase, but you've tried to hire some salespeople and it didn't work out, or you tried to hire a marketing or, or sales development team and that didn't work out. A lot of times that just means we didn't have the right systems, we didn't have the right architecture in place to support what we need in order to effectively achieve this scale up phase. It's, that's the process phase. So think about where you are in terms of are you in startup, ramp up, or scale up, regardless of how long your company's been around. So that's the first model that I've been sharing with people and it's been really effective. People have told me, they've come up to me after workshops or after speaking or send me notes on LinkedIn like, wow, that was really interesting to, to help me position where I am and all the challenges that I have ahead of me. Because even if, I'm, even if I want to be in scale up phase and, and I think I'm actually close, if I do the honest evaluation, maybe I'm still here in customer phase and there's a lot of work to do to get me from customers to revenue, revenue process to get from startup to ramp up, ramp up to scale up. These things don't happen overnight. They can happen more quickly if you have the right help and you have the right systems in place, but they can't just, you can't just decide to scale up, hire four people tomorrow, and think that you're gonna be able to 4X your company just because you hired four people. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the first model that I wanted to share. The second one is one that I wanna kind of think about this as a sales process. If you are selling your product or service, what are the core components and what's the kind of the path that you need to follow in order to have an effective sales process? And so the three kind of points on this triangle are paying customers, prospecting, and pipeline. Now you notice I started with paying customers because again, whether you are a true startup or you're a, an established company that's trying to grow more quickly, Oftentimes, we get so busy selling our stuff, we forget to identify who do we want our customers to be? Who are our ideal customers? Who are the people that are gonna help us maximize revenue? Who are the people that are going to receive the highest amount of value from the work that we provide to them or to the products that we provide to them? So I always, I, regardless of who I'm working with, every client, we always begin with, who is your ideal paying customer? Because once we know who our ideal paying customer is, that will help us drive towards what sort of prospecting work we do. If we know, if we're really clear about the problems that these customers have, and we're really clear about who those companies and who the people are within those companies that have those problems, that's gonna yield for us how to do our prospecting. All of those activities that you can do to find new prospects, whether it's spending time on LinkedIn or doing webinars or conferences or going to other lives event, live events or uh, publishing white papers or doing blog posts, doing inbound versus outbound or cold calling versus warm calling, if you will. So first of all, get, get that transition from paying customers to prospecting only begins if we know exactly who we want to sell to and who has the key problems that we can solve. So once we've got our prospecting kind of bucket, if you will, then we want to transition those early conversations from just interesting conversations to a real sales pipeline. These are, this is the, the part of the real deal detector, if you will, that I talked about. 
having a really good demo design. How are you demonstrating your product? How are you demonstrating your capabilities in a way that gets those early prospects to go, oh, I want that. That's for me. Right? This is also places where things like pilot program build, having a good pilot program strategy, or knowing how to get those early customers from just telling you that they're interesting, like they're interested, to interested in buying, right? And that's that transition from early stage to late stage serious sales opportunities, okay? And now we've got these in our sales pipeline to use some sales speak. The last thing we need to do, of course, is convert them from being opportunities to becoming our paying customers. And that's the pipeline pull through strategies that I talked about, having a sales map and a closed plan, knowing how you're gonna convert those, those pipeline opportunities to paying customers if we don't know how they're going to achieve the return on investment. If we haven't built a closed plan or a work plan or an implementation plan, then it's gonna to be tough for them to pull the trigger because they just don't trust us. And so when we kind of run this circuit together uh, throughout from starting with who you want your customers to be to prospecting the pipeline, that's what yields for you your sales process, right? So until you know how to run this cycle, you can't scale up. You can't just hire somebody and say, hey, sell my stuff if you don't even know how to find those target buyers in the first place. Or let's say you have those target buyers, but you don't know how to get them serious or how to get them from serious to paying customers, then you're never going to be able to scale because you don't have those blueprints in place. And that's why I talk about things like a revenue acquisition portfolio and an activity audit, audit and sales plans and close plans and all of those things that are prerequisites to getting to that ramp up and scale up phase. Right? And so this, just to kind of summarize this model, the second of the three that I want to go through, and then we'll wrap up. This first section is all around generating clarity. It's clarity for you and your team to know exactly which customers you're going after. And it's clarity for the market to know why you're getting in touch. Because now you're connecting on the problems that they have and you've sourced the right people that have those problems. So this first side of the process is all around clarity. The second side, here is all around control. Maintaining control of the sales process. Knowing what to do when somebody says, hey, this looks great, send me a proposal. Because we all know what happens when you send proposals. We have to find ways to maintain control of the sale so that we're not leaving it up to chance that our sales leads become serious opportunities. Right? And then finally, this third, this third side is about confidence. And again, it's confidence for you and it's confidence for the customer. It's confidence for you to know that you're delivering a huge amount of value and that gives you the right to charge the price that you want to charge, the, the price that you deserve to charge because of the value you're giving, because of the support you're providing to helping that customer grow their business or reduce costs or reduce risk. And it's confidence for the customer because they deserve the confidence to know that, hey, if I sign this contract and I implement this system or I implement the software or I hire this consultant, that they are going to deliver for me and I'm going to see the, the return on my investment, that this is an investment, not a cost. So these are kind of the three, the three sides, if you will, of this process of customers prospecting and pipeline. Because if we do these three things right, we'll have clarity, control, and confidence and that will help us get from startup to ramp up and from ramp up to scale up. Because now we will have achieved a process, we will have maximized our revenue, and that will give us all the faculties that we need in order to get to a much larger team so we can scale the organization. So that's model number two, that, that the feedback that I've gotten from people as I'm doing workshops, doing speaking, that people told me this has been really, really useful for them. And again, I wanna, I wanna sort of challenge you, if, I, if, I will, if you will, to think about your own process. Do you, have you thought about your ideal paying customers? Have you thought about what is the right prospecting plan of action to go and find those customers? Do you have a way of maintaining control in the sale? How are you maintaining and creating confidence in yourself, in your team, in your product, and your customer so that they have no problems getting things started with you? So that's, that's model number two.
And model number three, this is where this is where you have to do some very honest evaluations about where you are and where you want to be. And so it starts off with a really simple line, right? Just think of it as a timeline. We're sitting here today, and we know that we have this future ahead of us, right? We all know that the future is here, it's coming, right? And typically, uh, when I work with teams and I work with companies, as much as we have a three or a five year strategy plan, most teams, they wanna focus on say roughly the next 12, sometimes 18 months. So this kind of becomes our, our future, the next 12 months. And so we're thinking ahead over the next 12 months. And this is where we have to start evaluating where do we wanna be and where are we relative to that place. And so that, that perfect place, that we, the place we want to be, that's what you can kind of call the ideal state. So if we have this ideal state out here. So for some companies, it's getting to a certain amount of revenue per month. It's a, a $1 million annual recurring revenue or $2 million annual recurring revenue. Because not only are we going to enjoy the fruit of that revenue in software land, in startup land, oftentimes that's going to give us the ability to go raise some capital so we can scale up the organization. So the ideal state is oftentimes some amount of revenue, and sometimes that revenue will also gain additional capital so we can grow. And maybe the ideal state doesn't have to be, you know, an extra $2 million in revenue. It could be something as simple as increasing our deal sizes. Like if right now, over the next, you know, if in the next 12 months we can go from an average revenue per customer from 10000 up to 25,000 or go from $25,000 per customer to 50 or even getting a couple hundred thousand dollar customers. If we could get one or 200 K customers in the next 12 months, that's really going to put me in a position of strength for myself, for my clients, uh, for my team to know that we are getting to the phase of scale up, right? We're able to tackle bigger problems for our ideal customer. So, Usually, we'll just use, I'll just use dollar signs more generally as a way to think about that ideal state. So somewhere between this ideal state that we have for ourselves and our company and where we are now, right, over the next 12 months, there's somewhere in the middle, right? There's kind of this okay outcome. So if the ideal outcome is, we'll just call it three dollar signs, you know, maybe it's three million dollars in revenue or getting 300k deals, Maybe the okay state is, well, let me just get one dollar sign. Let me, if, I, if I really want to get to two or three million dollars in annual recurring revenue, if I can get to 750, that's okay. It's not great. It's not ideal. It's not where I want to be, but it's definitely better than the path I'm on right now, right? So we've got our ideal state and our okay state. Now, below the line, and we hope these things don't happen, things could go the wrong way, right? We know things could go poorly. And worst of all, we could have some kind of unmitigated disaster. And I, I don't mean to use that word uh, for hyperbole. It's, it's just the reality that we know as a company, something really bad could happen, right? Something could happen to our co-founder, something could happen to our market, something could happen to our funding that completely dries up our ability to operate as a company. Maybe we've got one big customer that we're relying on and a couple of small ones. And even though that big customer right now is stable, if something were to happen, and I've seen this with mergers and acquisitions, all of a sudden that, that buyout happens and you're no longer needed because that new acquiring company has a team in place and house or already has a partner to help them with the solution to the problem that you're solving, right? So we've got these other states of, of kind of below line. I'm just going to draw a line to each of these. And again, this is where you want to start doing the honest evaluation. I want you to think about your company. I want you to think about your team, your organization. Because if we're sitting here today and we're saying over the next 12 months, I want to hit this ideal state. Well, let's just be, let's be sort of evaluators of where you are with some of the key areas of your business. So I mentioned back here that kind of three big parts to 
your sales process, right? There's having clear paying customers, having a clear view of prospecting, knowing how to manage pipeline, and then getting some repeatability in that by doing it over and over. That's what gets you the process, right? So if we were to just look, if we were just to look at those areas and say, okay, well look, let's just let's put some let's do some easy scoring here. And right now, are we we know the current state of our paying customers. Are we clear on who we want our customers to be? Our ideal customers, would, they, would we be their ideal partner? Is there a match there? Because we can say we know who we want our customers to be, but do our customers want us to be their provider, right? So there's paying customers, there's, there's prospecting, right? there's pipeline management and pull through. There's um, things like the scaling piece. So we'll call this scale and process. So if we just take a few of these areas and say, okay, here's where we are. Here's our status quo line in each of these four areas. And for us to be on this path, to be on this ideal pathway to go from today to ideal, well, let's ask ourselves. And this is what, this is what I ask companies to do all the time. Say, so look, you say you want to be on the ideal state. Where is your, pay, like right now with paying customers, let's score on a scale of one to four. Is, are you, are you disaster, poor, okay, or ideal? Where are you if you had a score where you are with your ideal customers? Would your, would your customers now tell you that you're on the right path with them and that you're on the ideal state? Or would they say, yeah, we're pretty happy. We're kind of okay with you. Or, man, we're actually not 100% happy and we might think about other places to get the answers to our problems. Or worse, do you have a situation where you're experiencing a lot of churn? You get a customer and then they leave. Or you do one project with them and you can't get the second one. Or they give you the small project but not the big one. Right? That's, that's a case for disaster in a lot of things, in a lot of, in a lot of, a lot of places. The same thing with prospecting. You know, how are you going out and finding customers? Are they clear on your message? Do you have a good way of qualifying those leads that come in? Do you know how to demo your product or capabilities? How are you running your sales meetings? How are you doing your pilot programs? What's your close plan? What's your sales map? All of those things that go into prospecting and pipeline management, let's score where you are. Are you, are you on that ideal state? Are you up here where you need to be on a scale of one to four? Or are you down, down here? And if we look at each of these areas and try to score those, and just say, are you, which of these four paths are you on with each of these key areas? If you honestly assess yourself and say, look, am I on the ideal state, the okay state, status quo, poor, or disaster? If you're not, you know, on or at least very, very close to your ideal state in each of these areas of your business, if you're not on this path, with each of these key areas, then each of these areas are just pulling you down, right? You can't be on the ideal track if everything around your sales process is either okay or status quo or worse, below the line. So if we were to hang these on this, on this ideal state, would it pull you down? Or can you honestly say you're up here with each of these areas? And if you're not, then you're not going to get to that ideal state in the time that you want. Now look, you could be on this okay path, but it's going to take you much longer. You'd have to extend all the way out off the chart, off the screen, to hit your ideal number of dollars. Say three dollar signs might take you two or three or four times as long to hit because you don't have the right systems, you don't have the right pieces in place in order to hit that ideal state. And so if I were to kind of collect all of this and we look at this, this, this line, if you can hit this line in all of these key areas of your sales process, of your company process, this is what I call your ramp of repeatability. Right? If you're on this ramp, this means you're on the path to getting growth, to getting scale. To getting to going from customers to revenue, revenue to process, to go from startup to ramp up, ramp up to scale up. 
Because if you're doing all of those things along this line, that means you've got the right systems in place. You've got a really clear view on how to run the business. Everything from sales to marketing to customer service, as well as customer support and new product development. Everything else that goes with continuing to grow and scale the company. So I would just say, think about where you are in each of those areas and do that honest assessment. Because if you're not on that ramp, you can't possibly hit that ideal state. Right? So those are the three models. Those are the, the three that have kind of bubbled to the surface when, uh, when I talk with people in different parts of the country doing different speaking and all, all the work that I do in workshops and working with clients and bringing on new clients as well. So I just wanted to share that. I thought it was a, a good time of the year to do that as I'm doing kind of a wrap up of this first, these last couple of months and looking back, reflecting on the hundreds of conversations I've had, both with, with people at conferences, at workshops, at speaking, as well as clients. And I wanted to share that because I, I feel like it's too important. It's, it's, it's too important for me to know that there are teams and entrepreneurs and companies out there that have these visions of being an ideal state and can get to the ideal state, they just don't have the right, the right systems in place to get there. And so get working harder and grinding more is not going to get you there. And so if you want help and you're not sure how to ask, the first thing you can do is just, you know, pop me a note or send me an email or let's jump on a, on a call for a few minutes. And even if you don't ask me, I, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me because I know that there are enough people out there that can help you solve your problems. But these are problems that I have solved. These are, I have solved these problems for three different startups. I've been a VP at sales at three different startups and in all three cases, taken them from virtually zero revenue to the first millions in revenue. I've got clients right now and, and believe me, nothing jazzes me more than seeing my clients be successful to get on that on that ramp. I mean, just over the last couple of weeks, I've gotten emails and phone calls with clients where they've closed deals with companies like Costco and um, University of Philadelphia, Kaiser Permanente, right? These are all parts of working together with clients, and that's the joy that I get from seeing this. So I hope this, is, this has been useful for you. I hope this has been a, um, educational for you. And if you have any questions about what I've gone through here, just give me a shout and we'll work and we can, uh, can talk through it. So that's it. Scott Simbucci signing off.